Hey folks, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. This is your guest host, Cliff Gray. Today I have Chad Mendez on the podcast. Chad is a professional bare knuckle boxer and UFC fighter, but most importantly, he's an avid hunter and fisherman. Today we are going to talk about the intense passion he has for the outdoors and his fins and feather guiding service. I've watched for years now as Chad has grown that business, so I really want to hear the details of that progression. I also want to delve into all the different adventures it has taken him on. I look at your social media and website, Chad, and it's wild, man. We're talking gator hunts, elk hunts, muley hunts, you know, just a bunch of really cool stuff. So I want to talk about all those adventures. Before we uh, we jump into that, Chad, if there's anything I missed in this intro, man, uh, let the viewers know and we'll uh, we'll go from there. Heck yeah. Well, thanks for having me on, man. It's good to, to be on here. I think I did Jay's podcast quite a few years ago, but um, it's it's been a little bit. But yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, man, I think you nailed it. I mean, we got fins and feathers. There's a couple other businesses I've I've just been kind of putting my nose to the grindstone on and trying to grow. We got the provider, which is uh, uh, basically like a dry rub company that we, we created a wild game cookbook that goes along with it. Um, you know, hunting, obviously hunting and fishing has always been a huge passion of mine, but creating amazing meals uh, with the bounty, you know, has it's always been a huge passion as well. And I, I don't know if that comes from just years of cutting weight with wrestling and fighting and, you know, kind of starving myself and then seeing all these shows where, you know, these, these amazing looking dishes get prepared. And, you know, so it, the creativity for me, that's like something that, that I love to do the create the creative part of it. But um, yeah, so we have the provider um, American Ama beef, uh, which is a beef company that me and uh, four other buddies started here in, uh, locally in Northern California, but basically no antibiotics, no hormones, no soy, no corn. Um, we basically feed, we finish these steers are grass fed and then finish them on a proprietary blend of feed that we've created, um, which is, you know, all just a very high octane nutritious, uh, blend of almonds, prunes, uh, you know, roughage. We got a, just a very specific, uh, blend of feed that gives a really good marbling and a really good flavor to the fat. So, uh, makes the meat really tender as well. So that's, I mean, that's another thing we've kind of been doing. I got, I got my hands in too many damn things. My wife definitely isn't a, a huge fan of all the the activities that, that are going on outside of the house, but uh, it's what's put, put food on the table. So she can't be too upset about it, but yeah, no, I, I can, I can relate, man. And you're like in that zone of where kids are, what'd you say the age of yours are? Uh, two and a half and one. Yeah. So it's like a full-time gig, just keeping them from like jumping oh, yeah. into the you know, jumping into whatever can hurt him. I feel like my, my youngest is five, Chad. And I feel like he's still in that zone of like, if I'm not watching him, like he's just going to find some way to kill himself. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. There could be a thousand different things that are safe and there's one dangerous thing and they, they are just always drawn to that one thing. Oh yeah. 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 Know what the hell it is, but yeah, for sure. Man. <laughs> but in, and, and we'll, we'll, I want to talk to you about kids and stuff. Anybody who's like a big hunter and out in outdoorsman, I always want to kind of talk to them. And I'm sure the audience of this podcast is interested in too, like what their plan is to try to introduce them, you know? So we'll, yeah. we, we'll get into that Chad, but you were talking about your, uh, your beef business. Are you still on like a carnivore esque diet or high protein? Yeah. What, what's your, what are you doing on that right now? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know the correct terminology. I guess a meat-based diet is what you can call it. Sure. Um, I did strict carnivore for about four months when I first jumped on the diet, more of just like an elimination uh, diet, you know, and I have a uh, plaque psoriasis really bad all over my body. I've had it my whole life. And, uh, you know, I've been to multiple dermatologists trying to figure out like, how do I get rid of this? It's starting to spread throughout my body. I got all over my legs, my head, you know, spots on my, my cavity, my elbows. And it's, you know, just as I get older, it's getting worse and worse. Sure. And there's, there's never been any type of advice other than here, take these pills. Here's a shot, use this ointment, use this cream. And it's, you know, both of them straight up told me the diet had zero effect on on psoriasis there's no studies to prove that and almost got offended when i even asked about it but it wasn't like i was trying to prove anything i didn't even know about the carnivore diet or anything yeah you're like just looking for it, a solution sure. yeah and so uh sean baker and uh, paul saldino uh basically kind of opened my eyes a little bit more to this diet along with rogan i know rogan has an autoimmune disease i think vitiligo and oh, okay uh, you know, uh, so he said he did it and it helped, you know, he did it for like a month and it helped tremendously. So I don't know. I just started leaning towards giving it a try 
about a year and a half ago, uh, mainly because I couldn't figure out anything else. I, you know, I didn't want to be on a, a routine shot every month that's extremely hard on your your organs. You know, these ointments and creams, they help it a little bit, but they don't take it away. They don't fix it. It's just, you know, a little bit better. And then as soon as you stop with the ointment, it's right back again. Um, and a lot of those things make you feel really crappy and I'm just not into it, the pills and all that stuff. So I was like, screw it. I'm going to try it. So I, I, for the first four months did nothing but meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood, uh, yeah. nothing, else. no fruits, no vegetables, you know, no processed sugars, nothing, just meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood. And there was a, a little bit of some seed oils at, at that point. That wasn't really something I was really focused on. Didn't really know much about it. It was just going to try to eliminate as much as I could. There was a few things I was eating that still had seed oils here and there. Um, and so the psoriasis got better in those four months. Um, but then I started slowly adding things back in, uh, but it, it didn't go away until I completely cut out um, the seed oils, which was about May or June of this this year. And within like two or three weeks, my psoriasis was completely gone at that point. And it was oh, okay. like way better at that point. So yeah, man, I, I basically am just doing meat, fruits, you know, honey is my sweetener. Um, what am I? Meats, fruits. I do some dairy. I try to do raw dairy. Yeah, and I, man, um, it's it's funny, Chad, because what what you're describing is very similar to to my diet too. I kind of follow the same thing, like a lot of protein, but some fruit. And I noticed that a lot of people kind of have that same progression that you had. Like they go to all meat, they solve a problem, and then they're able to add. They're they're able to get like a little flexibility, right? That seems to be yeah. pretty comment man do you notice um and you're you you, you have a big uh, audience do you notice that there's like there's like closet carnivores they don't like they, they're almost like embarrassed to talk about yeah. it you know yeah. and i think it's funny oh, that yeah. people are like that like you're i can even tell like you're slightly hesitant because you're, you're like ah oh, people are gonna like judge that i'm yeah. eating this like mainly mainly meat well, diet. Yeah, I, it's still even family members now you know i have family members that are in the medical field even you know, when I tell them what my diet is, they automatically are like, oh, what? You're going to have a heart attack. You can't have that much cholesterol. You can't have that much meat, that much fat. And it's like, we, we've been brainwashed our whole lives thinking that that stuff's all the enemy, you know? And it's, no, you know, what's the enemy is all the processed junk that we're eating on a daily basis through the American diet, you know? And uh, yeah, it's crazy. Like the the type of kickback you get. I've seen, I've seen a meme lately. Like it was pretty funny. It's like, you got, I get such a, a kickback and it shows like a dozen eggs, you know, over easy. Yeah. Like if I eat a 12 eggs in a day, I'm going to have a heart attack, but it, nobody says anything. And it's like a whole happy bill, uh, uh, big Mac meal next to it. And it's like, God, you're right. Like everybody's okay with a big Mac meal and doesn't, doesn't even think twice about it. But yeah. I tell you that I'm going to eat 12 eggs in a day. You're going to have a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but that's, we've been brainwashed, man. It's crazy. But yeah. Um, yeah, and I and I don't know how you feel about it, man. I'm still like, I'm still a little bit hesitant because uh, I don't know, you know, because people the same mm -hmm. thing like family members will express like concern, like man, you know, like is eating. Cause I'm gonna delve in this a little bit more with you because I have a specific question related to beef. Because mm -hmm. in in a lot of my, I have a brother who's a doctor, and it's like I eat a lot of red meat on it. And I'm assuming you do too, to you know, mm -hmm. for the fat content, and it's like. Well, I, you know, I don't know, is, you know, is it going to shorten my lifespan? I personally have no idea. It's not like I've read all the research, but the problem is, is like I get immediate kind of like awesome effects from changing mm -hmm. the diet. So it's hard for me to, to really judge where I'm at on it. But yeah. what I was going to ask you, Chad, and I think, I think a lot of this audience will have been exposed mm -hmm. to this diet through from either Rogan or, you know, just whatever. There's probably some yeah. overlap of the concepts that they've heard about it. Um, and it's funny because, I was helping uh, Jay Scott guide a Arizona sheep hunt this last week, and he's starting to transition to it. Too. Really? Because he, oh, he and Jay will listen to this, and and he uh, he'll laugh because I'm always harassing him because he eats pop tart. He eats like shit like pop tarts, yeah. man. Um, yeah. And so, uh, anyways, uh, I I harass him about that. But anyway, so he's starting to transition that way. Okay. But in the context of like the hunting world, one thing I tried, man, and it did not work was to only eat game meat. Have you, have, have you tried that or have you had, have you? 
No, I, I didn't. And I, right off the bat, the two doctors that I talked to that are, you know, more of the meat based type doctors basically said it's tough to do that because a protein is a very difficult thing for your body to use as an energy source. It's very hard to break down. Uh, and it, it doesn't have a ton of calories per, um, per gram. So fat is what you need. Fat is our bodies are, are meant to use fat as its first fuel source. So yeah. our diet in the United States, we, we've had so many carbohydrates thrown into everything with all the grains and, you know, cereals and whatever it may be. Our bodies have made the transition to using carbohydrates now as a first fuel source. But yeah, so I think you definitely need the fat. Wild game is extremely lean, uh, you know, and even, even uh, like my ground that I make from deer or elk, whatever, I'll still do a 25% beef fat add in um, on that just because you got to have the fat. The fat is the energy source. Um, yeah. you know, the protein is, it's a healthy protein, obviously, but yeah, you need, you need the fat for sure. Yeah, no, I got you, man. And I, and I found you're just smarter than I was about it right off the bat. Um, I came to that same conclusion, but it took, yeah. it took, it took me a couple of weeks of doing it. Like on, you know, I was just, I always had elk, you know, cause the business I was in or whatever, I always had elk, you know, I always had game meat as I'm sure you do. So I tried to go just with that and it doesn't, it d doesn't work. So mm -mm. Uh, yeah. you were smart enough to know that off the bat. I was smart yeah, enough. I to used to do all my, again, like even when I was training through college and first few, you know, first eight, 10 years of my fight career, like I didn't, I didn't know any of this stuff. You know, I, I wish I would have been exposed to this earlier in my career, but you know, fat, fat's not the enemy, especially someone that's, you know, training at a high octane levels, you know, fat's good. And I've always like, I remember just doing all my grind on deer and uh, elk, just pure game meat, not, no fat yeah, added, sure. you know, and it's, it's like, damn it, what the hell is I thinking? Like, I wish yeah, I yeah. I mean, well, and act that 20 to 25% in there, you know, it, a, it tastes way better. And it, I, now when I eat that, like, I feel so energized, like ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I, I, I think, uh, and, and maybe you feel this, I, I always felt like there's a little like negative connotation to adding domestic mm -hmm. fat to yeah. wild game. Like, oh, you're going to like ruin it. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm with you, man. I think for the audience of the podcast too, if you do try this diet, exactly what Chad's saying, like, you've got to, you've got to consume and, and tell me your perspective on Chad, but like, you got to consume like enough fat where if you're not used to it, it feels absurd. It feels absurd yeah. how much fat yeah. you're consuming. Um, yeah, for sure. And my, my wife, like it took her a while in the beginning. She's still like a little hesitant on it. Like I use butter for everything cooking and, you know, I just try to use the animal fats for everything instead of, you know, obviously any seed oils or anything like that. And, you know, it's again, we've been taught our whole lives, like butter is bad for you. It's high in fat, high in cholesterol. It's going to give you a heart attack. And every once in a while, my wife still just kind of gets a little icked out by it. And I'm like, we got to get past it. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, no, I got you. you know? <laughs> sure. hey, so. Have you tried, uh, have you tried staying on it during, you know, either just a lot of travel or on backcountry hunts or yeah. anything like that? You yeah, have, so did, how have you, you done it? Yeah, this year was the first year that I've had to worry about backcountry hunts. I mean, really, I started it last year, but it was like after all those. So this year was the first year I did my Alaska hunt and then that backcountry New Mexico elk hunt. Um, and it's tough, man. I mean, every <laughs> I went with all the hush guys on that New Mexico hunt sure. and those guys love their treats, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They love all their same thing, Pop-Tarts and yeah, yeah. Twinkie Cohoes, like all, all the, the bad stuff. But I'm sitting there snacking on like straight jerky, you know, just salt and pepper jerky. Yeah. And, but it's tough, man. You really, you got to sit down and plan it out. You know, I'd bring like dates. I love, I love dates and like dried dates and dried fruits and, you know, anything like that. That's a going to be super lightweight, but you know, as much sugar as I can possibly get, I can't really get my sugar anywhere else outside of like honey packets, dried fruits. Um, I would do my peak meal, um, which was an insane carb overload for me every night. But, you know, obviously you're probably only getting maybe seven, 800 calories, seven or 800 calories throughout the day while you're snacking. And then yeah. you'd have your big meal at night, you know? And so I would always do the bison ranch mashers. It doesn't have seed oils. Um, the carbohydrates are potatoes, which 
I don't typically eat potatoes or rice, but every once in a while, I'll still add that in. And it seems like um, if I'm not doing it for consistent long periods of time, it doesn't really affect the psoriasis. But I notice if it's like, if I start eating rice every single day for like two or three weeks, it would definitely It'll come start back. Coming back. Yeah, I so I think, I think, you know, the potatoes, the bison, a little bit of vegetables, you know, it didn't seem to bother me too much. So that's what I was pretty much doing on both the sheep hunt and that, and that, um, uh, New Mexico hunt. So, but yeah, mostly it's just dried fruits, uh, um, RX bars, they made a pretty good bar where it's, you know, dates and egg whites and, uh, some almonds. And, um, I think that's pretty much it. There's like three or four ingredients, super clean bars. So I'd snack on those throughout hikes and stuff on uh, midday, <laughs> but yeah, man, it was, it was definitely a lot more detailed planning for that going into these backcountry hunts on this diet. There's just yeah. not a ton of options. It's not like hard to pack. It's just you're pretty much eating the same things every single day, which I pretty much do that anyways at home. There's not a ton of, you know, you're eating meat, fruit, mixing anything with honey, some yogurt, you know, that's pretty much it. Jerky. Yeah. yeah are, sure. Like I don't have a ton of options. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's just on, well, it's, I almost said something that I had to laugh to myself, laugh to myself because for you, this isn't, probably that unique because you're used to you know being an athlete but for a lot of us including myself when I go on a backcountry hunt the, my biggest fear is to get in like a really bad calorie deficit and yeah. so I have to it's hard for me to stay on it Chad because I'm so worried that the the limited options I'm just not going to get enough calories and, it, and that yeah. beats me up bad mm -hmm. um, have you ever tried pemmican before no Dude, you should try it, man. So it, uh, there's no there's no real commercial availability of like true pemmican, but all it is is like, I'll, I'll I'll make this real brief, but some of the viewers might think it's interesting too. But I take meat that as if I'm gonna turn it into jerky, and I smoke it, but I smoke it for like three times as long as I would at, for jerky. So it's like it's basically like dust dry, <clears throat> grind it up. And then I'll maybe I'll put like some dried blueberries in there or something like that. But you don't have to. You can put a little honey, little things to season it, red pepper or something. Mm -hmm. But you just take that dried meat powder and then you add tallow, like rendered beef fat to oh, it. No Dude, and it like you have to get I, I bet because you're used to So is to it like a paste? It. No, it's like a it, it's it's uh it you can make it the consistency you want, right? Because the more tallow you add, the more the softer it's gonna be. Now, if you're in like on really warm weather hunts, you have to deal with the fat, uh, the fact that exactly. it is kind of a paste. And mm -hmm. you know how I got around that is when you vacuum pack it, vacuum pack it like an otter pop. You know what an otter pop is? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. So vacuum so pack it like that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Dude, that's a good call. So even if it gets hot, you can consume it that way. Now, if it's like a cold weather hunt, it, it's more of like you can keep it like a brownie consistency. It's no big deal. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. But because you've been eating so much fat, man, you'd probably be like, oh, this stuff's good. You know, yeah. it, it, it turns it some people. Good. Yeah, yeah. It, it turns some people off because they're not used to eating the fat. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. um, but that yeah, man, give it, give, give it a try. Yeah, like a little bump throughout the day, like. That's a good good way to stay out of that calorie deficit for sure. If you're yeah, starting yeah, yeah. To a little laggy, just pop one of those. You'd probably yeah. be money. Yeah, yeah. So give it a look into that. Try, man. Well, and the thing that's crazy about it, it has indefinite shelf life too. Yeah. Suppose I mean, supposedly they used to keep it like that for like years, you know. Oh, no wait. Um, but yeah, uh, but yeah. You call it again. Uh, pemmican. Man, I'm gonna write that down. That's cool. Yeah, man. The the thing about it, Chad, is like you have to you have to find like uh like an original, like the real recipe, you, you know, there's like, they call yeah. it like there's commercial jerky. They call pemmican. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. you, you, you have to look it up, but yeah, dude, give it a try and, and let me know. Uh, let me know what dude, you, I might make what a bunch of those just for even office, like daily work, because like right now I just got like some jerky, you know, it's basically a, uh, uh, it's salt, garlic. Yeah. Salt, beef, water, garlic just plain as plain jerky as you can. That's all like, that's all I pretty much snack on throughout the day. You know, I have my big breakfast where it's, you know, four eggs or so with some fruit and um, maybe half avocado or something. 
post workout, then I come in the office and just snack, and then usually do like a big steak for dinner with some fruit and another avo or something, you know. Yeah, but that'd be sure. cool just midday to just pop some of those and yeah, yeah, good, good. Yeah, way give it, give going. it a try, man. Or, or I mean, you're in those businesses. Get a, um, get a you commercial get option them. figured out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good call. <laughs> uh, I think I think I uh, I think that there's a lot of people out there trying this stuff, so I think it'll it'll yeah. continue to grow, man. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But uh, speaking of business ideas and stuff, I was looking at your website, and I think um, for a lot of the listeners of uh, this podcast, you know, they're um, some of them are advanced hunters, uh, Chad. But I noticed that a lot of them just interacting with them are kind of new to the sport and. Yeah. I, I uh, um, stuck my toes into this kind of business concept a little bit myself, but it looks like you guys are executing on it quite a bit. And that's this, you're doing kind of like a, like an introduction to hunt is one of your hunt options, right? Um, yeah, yeah. This, this tell is me our about first it, year. Man. Yeah, so that's through Fins and Feathers. That's a, a, a business that me and a really good friend of mine started back in 2015. Um, and we've just kind of, basically what we call it is like a celebrity outdoor service. Basically the, the only difference between booking with us and booking with another outfitter is that we, we try to make it a little more unique by putting different athletes on the trips with the clientele. So just kind of make it a new memorable experience where, you know, maybe I'm going to go do a cool Utah mule deer hunt, but not only am I going to go do a cool Utah mule deer hunt, Dan Henderson is going to be there and camp staying at the same lodge as us hunting with us, going out and like trying to kill a big old buck with us. So sure. You know, something that's just unique. We do these tuna trips out of San Diego, which these are some of my funnest trips of the year, man. It's uh, usually quite a bit of tequila and beer and really good weather and big bluefin tuna and uh, really good food on the boat, you know, and just everybody having a good time. So we usually go out like two or three days at a time. Um, but yeah, this year we just, we started our first academy is what we're calling it, Fins and Feathers Academy, where basically we we teamed up with Gunworks um, in our outfitter that we use for our, our cow elk hunts to combine like a, um, basically like a little introduction, like a crash course to hunting late season cow elk, just giving these guys kind of a rundown on what to look for, you know, what the terrain is going to be like, you know, that type of stuff. And then we do basically a day and a half of classroom stuff with gun works. Their instructors come out, these guys, you know, shooting, know hows how to do all the long range stuff we get on on the range and we do um you know different breathing techniques how to hold your hands a bunch of just like fine tuning stuff for a lot of these beginner guys that have never shot long, long range or shot at all and sure. so it's a good way to teach uh these guys how to do that stuff and then we take all that stuff that we've learned in the classroom and on the shooting range and then do a two or three day cow elk hunt with all that that skill set that they just learned um, and it was fun, man. This was our first year doing one. We did it up in Oregon. Uh, I think we had six guys come out and, uh, man, it was a blast. We, it was cold. We, it was a little, a little cold, but you know, that's part of hunting. I think that's a, a cool, um, thing to throw in there. You sometimes got to deal with the weather, you know that. So, yeah, yeah, sure. uh, yeah, man, we, we had a lot of fun doing it. We're, so we're going to do that one again next year. And then we're also working on a trophy Audad, uh, long range school out in Texas, Oh, okay. So, you know, guys are more worried about just getting meat. They want the elk. We have a cool cow elk one. And then we're trying to do something maybe for some people that are a little bit more advanced. It doesn't have to be. It could be beginners as well. But give them something more of like a trophy animal to go after, you know. And so it's all the same long range shooting stuff, you know, phenomenal facilities and then some really good hunting after. So yeah, we'll kind yeah. of see how it plays out. But yeah, I love it. I love the. uh the Audad concept too, in addition to your cow elk one, it, it's, it's interesting, man, because tell me your thoughts on this, but I think a lot of people, like there's this growing group of people that want to get into hunting, but their parents didn't, their, you know, their dad didn't hunt or, or whatever. That's for sure growing. I mean, you mentioned Rogan. Um, and I know you, you've, you've been on his podcast. I could ask you a thousand questions about that. That's probably <laughs> pretty, pretty cool. But, um, but you know, he has his, in, in a sense, he's kind of changed the game a little bit and brought a bunch of people that fit that category into the hunting world. And it's so intimidating, man. It's so intimidating for somebody who wasn't exposed to it. I, I realized that from my, my outfitting and guiding days, like 
I took it for granted that I was around it mm-hmm. my whole life. But then you realize like, man, there's a lot of people that want to get into this, but there's not a real intuitive way. So if uh, anybody's like interested, I think these kind of things are the way, the way to do it, man. And it's not, yeah. you know, they're, they're like, it, tell me if I'm wrong, Chad, but you're hitting the things that make a lot of sense to me. Like you're even your odd ad hunts, they're probably really high success rate hunts. Mm-hmm. Your, mm-hmm. your cow elk hunts are high success rate hunts which to me is key. Yeah. It's still like yeah. hunting, but you get to go through that process of like yeah. dealing with the animal and everything. And yeah. that's, that's huge, man. I think, you know, I think that it, you know, like a lot of guys start with elk hunting, right. And they're going to go on like a over the counter, you know, archery backpack yeah. hunt for their first introduction to hunting. And that's awesome, well, man. Like more, more the power things you can do right off the bat. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> One of the hardest things you could yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's like you're jumping up yeah. way into like the big leagues in a sense, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and it, yeah, you can learn a, a ton by going on the type of hunts you just mentioned. So, yeah. so that's awesome, man. Um, yeah. I, uh, if I would have stayed in an outfitting business, I would have pursued that business in intense. Cause I think yeah. I, the other thing is, I mean, it's probably super fun to do. You know what I mean? It you is, have yeah. like enthusiastic, enthusiastic yeah. people that, you know, they're mm-hmm. like, I assume that, you know, most of these are adults that are going on your hunts. They're like, but there's still like a kid element, right? Cause they're yeah. learning something. So. Yeah. No, it's fun, man. That's ultimately in the beginning of trying to figure out fins and feathers and like how we were going to structure this, this business and, you know, where we wanted it to go in, in the future was basically helping beginner people that want to get into the sport of hunting and, and understand what everything looks like. And coming to us like, okay, how do I do this? And we we get a lot of guys from, especially from the MMA world that follow me through the fighting world that have never even thought about hunting. But over the last few years, just following along and seeing like the process of going out and hunting and then having all this meat in my freezer with the last couple of years of uncertainty with supermarkets and, you know, food availability and the scare with all the COVID stuff. And, you know, I think there's more people like leaning on, God, I should probably learn how to do this. Or sure. I, I think I should, you know, I think it would be cool. So we get a lot of those guys that come over that I've never hunted before. And just like you said, I don't have anyone in my family that has ever done it, but I'd like to learn how do I start? And, you know, we guide them through, okay, first you got to go get your hunter safety course done. You know, this is where you can find it. Just set up, set up the appointment, go do it. And we get a lot of guys and girls that go and do that. And then they'll come back to us and say, I, all right, I got, let's get something booked, you know, yeah, which yeah. is super cool. Um, we have a, a, a wild pig ranch up here in Northern California, like near Reading area. And, okay. you know, that's another good first time hunt. You know, there's a lot of game up there. So you got a ton of pigs, you got a lot of opportunity, obviously pigs, you know, the eyesight, you know, it is, isn't like a deer or an elk, you know, they're pretty busy when they're feeding. So their attention span is usually focused on what they're doing. As long as the wind's right, they're pretty typically pretty easy to get it on, sure. which is great for beginner hunters. You can kind of explain things as you're going and break things yeah, down, yeah. get them set up, take their time. Um, and so we do a lot of that stuff up there also. So, um, but yeah, it's, for me, it's, that's probably the most rewarding part of all this is just seeing someone who's never done it, going out, getting their hunter safety course done, coming to us, trusting in us to basically they take them on their first, you know, guided hunt of anything. And then we go out and teach them the ways. And then I mean, we've had a lot of guys, uh, not only book multiple hunts with us, but start booking other places. And I usually recommend like, Oh, I want to go do a cool deer hunt. Or do you have any recommendations here and send them over there? And then you start seeing all these pictures on their Instagram of them going out and getting meat and like cooking oh, yeah. it, you know, tagging us in it. It's just a cool, like rewarding feeling to be able to basically teach somebody like that and my daughter my oldest daughter right now is just kind of getting into it she's I think she's going to be a daddy's girl like she loves going okay. sitting in turkey blind with me and uh she's done a deer hunt here in California with me this year and we got a nice buck and so she's like wanting to do it which is super cool to me so hopefully here in the next few years she's tagging along with with her own bow or own gun going out on a hunt with me so we'll see yeah no I I hear you man I uh so my question on that front, because I, I battle this, man, like, you know, my kids have been around hunting their whole life. Mm-hmm. You know, my oldest is 10. And uh, in a sense, like they it's it's odd because I particularly my older daughter, like I don't see like a real spark 
like a spark of interest in it. But it's weird because she's, you know, she said if she sees a, you know, a skinned elk skull on a tailgate of my truck, like it's just like another day to her. You yeah. Know what I mean? <laughs> and so uh -huh. it's like she she's not she's not you know like a normal kid might be like disgusted by that or whatever she but but she also i haven't like i haven't like flickered up a passion in her yet and yeah. i i just have this internal debate man like do yeah. do i try to like get it going or like what's the deal on it? how do how do you yeah. think about that yeah man it's a tough one me and my wife talk about that like obviously i'm never like forcing it like come on we have to go honestly the last few times like we did a fall turkey hunt a couple times the last few weeks and she was the one that was asking like i want to go turkey oh, cool. hunting which is super cool you know but i don't know if it's at this point in her life like i don't know if she actually cares about the hunting part of it other yeah. outside of just spending time with dad you know doing sure. something outside, you know which if that's ultimately what keeps her doing it i'm i'm all for that but yeah man i don't it's tough you, you don't want to force any of that stuff on them you know same same with sports. I mean, I wanted to play a sport. Um, you know, we've tried a, a few different ones now and it doesn't seem to have, you know, none of them have that interest spark yet, but I mean, she's young, you know, yeah, yeah. I think give it a few more years and things will start clicking a little bit more, but yeah, man, that we'll see. I mean, we'll just kind of keep rolling along like we are right now and just hopefully that love for both sports and hunting in the outdoors just kind of grows. And I mean, she calls me Papa Daddy, so Papa Daddy is going to be doing it, no matter what. So yeah, yeah, sure. Come along, let's go. Yeah, but I, I like your perspective on it, man. I think that's something I'll keep uh, in my own uh, mind when I think about it. Is like think about it like spending time with them, not like yeah, I'm, I'm going to get them excited about hunting. You know, it's yeah. it's more just like spend time with them, and then they'll mm -hmm. they'll decide if that's their going to be a lifelong passion passion or not. And that that's kind of yeah. like reflecting on what you said with what you do in terms of introducing, uh, you know, adults to hunting is one thing about hunting is it, it, you don't see a lot of people, you know, Chad, that, that get into hunting and it's like a real, like, you know, a casual hobby. They tend to be like, it's not really for them or that it becomes like, it literally changes the <laughs> dynamic of their life, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I hear you. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool, man. I, I wish you the best on that part of your, part of your business because that. Yeah. That is like something that's very much needed. You know what I mean? Um, Heck yeah. All those, yeah. all those options. And hey, man, I got a question for you. I think this would be super useful to the audience in terms of there's a lot of people who are looking for all different types of hunts, like not necessarily the most expensive hunts in the world. They just, you know, they, it may be cow elk hunts on one end of the spectrum. It may be, you know, bighorn sheep hunts on the other end of the spectrum, but they're always, they're looking for options. And in a sense, when I look at your, your fins and feather business, like part of your business is essentially screening down to these cool trips. Um, mm -hmm. and I, like your thoughts on that or the process of how you do that, um, that might be useful to people, Chad, if you don't mind kind of telling us like how you, how you go about picking these trips. Yeah. So what you just explained is kind of what we wanted to, to build out as far as our schedule page. We want something that appeals to everybody. You know, we we want stuff that's kind of on the lower end, more affordable as far as price range goes. Um, obviously, I want everything to be exciting and everything to be fun. So basically what we did was, I mean, starting, I mean, I've been doing this probably since 2010 when I started going out and hiring outfitters or basically testing out different places. But um, basically, I go on these myself and I'll go run through just like a normal client where I'll go hunt with these people. I pay attention to, you know, how friendly all the guides are, how, how well they guide, um, you know, the, the lodging, you know, the food, um, and just kind of how the whole thing is, is ran. And if it's a place that I'm like, dude, I would totally rebook there and I would go do that myself again. You know, then I reach out and see, Hey, I have this business. Like, this is something that we do. I would love to try to team up with you guys uh, would you guys be interested in working with fins and feathers? So, you know, we did something on the lower price range and, uh, AKA our wild pig hunts or cow elk hunts, um, whatever that may be all the way up to our more expensive hunts that are, you know, your big elk hunts and mule deer hunts and stuff like that. So, um, and then a bunch of stuff in between. Um, ultimately I just want something that can basically appeal to anybody 
uh, on that price range spectrum, spectrum, but everything be fun and a very high quality outfit. So um, we've actually started talking about doing like not only the celebrity schedule, like what we have now, but also doing um, like a fins and feathers approved booking agency where we don't send any celebrities on there, but basically we'll go out and test out these outfitters. And then if it, if it passes the, the, the test of everything I just explained, like, you know, guides, good guides, great lodge, great food, um, successful hunting, you know, or game rich environment, you know, we'll basically add these guys over here is honestly in, in the, in the booking world, as far as like me going out, wanting to book a hunt, like, it's kind of scary, man. I've been duped before. I don't know if you ever have, but you know, you look at a website and you're like, God, these, these guys are awesome. You know, this guy must, this must be a really legit outfit and you pay thousands and thousands of dollars to come hunt with these guys and you show up and it's just a big scam, you know, and it's, it's scary. That's a lot of money that basically was wasted. So I think for me, when I'm this, this is going to be a good way for us to kind of represent not only that outfitter and know that, Hey, you know, we're going to be helping hopefully help market and bring clientele to you guys but we know that you guys are legit and it's going to make us look good here also you know so <clears throat> now the clients can trust in the fact that all right mendez has been out there and hunted with these guys this is someone that he would rebook with again i'm going to trust in that and know that i feel comfortable spending x amount of money to go hunt with these people so we talked about building out that too and that's probably something we'll do here maybe in the next year or two but um yeah, I mean, I, I just think that there's a lot of uncertainties in the in the guide world and trying to book different hunts or fishing trips and not really knowing things. So it can be a little bit scary. Um, and so I, I think ultimately having that, you know, that scale from maybe your higher upper end stuff all the way down to something that's a little bit more affordable can relate to more people. And then hopefully, you know, just give everybody that good time to get out there and, and load their freezers up with some really good game and meat and have a good time doing it. Yeah, dude, I, I love it because I, I mean, you hit on a bunch there, man. It's it, it's it's a challenge to like screen through all the opportunities, and like you said, there's there's just you know they're on the on the real negative side of things. There can just be misrepresentations, yeah. and then on the other side of things too is there's just you know there could be a mismatch of like what you expect and what yeah. they're offering. So yeah. I think you know a lot of guys that hunt they get a feel for that over time. Um, you know, you're doing these trips, so you, you know, you're actually going there and you know exactly what the setup is. So it's yeah. a nice service to provide people. And, and I guess at least my personal advice for people who are out there booking hunts is, you know, really try to, you know, don't, I guess, don't project what you want from outfitters. Like just try to interrogate them in the sense. So you know what they're offering, if it's for you or not, yeah. you know, and move, mm -hmm. move on. It's it, like you said, I mean, you nailed it, man. It's really, it's tricky. And it's for a lot of people, it's a lot of money. It's probably like the one trip where you're going to go on two trips a year. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I get it, man. You gotta, you, you know, it's, it can be really intimidating to people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on, on that, on that front. I totally, I totally, I totally get that. So, um, I, uh, I, I could see where like a booking, a kind of a booking type of business comes out of, comes out of your deal. And there's some, and there's some folks that are in that, in that, in that world that, that do a good job, but a lot of them seem to, I don't know what you've seen, Chad, but a lot of them focus on like the higher end hunts. Yeah. And, you know? and when I say dupe, I guess I was more like, I, I showed up and guides were drunk <laughs> oh yeah right. yeah yeah i hear you up late, you know just being very unprofessional you know didn't help with any pack out just you know it was it was just a bad representation of that yeah. outfit so uh you know I, I would i personally would always i mean there's no way that i would send clientele to anybody that had anything like that because aid that makes me look bad but i don't want them having a horrible trip like i you know like i just went through so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's some people out there that in any industry, in any business, there's, there's people that are going to try and scam. So yeah, I think it's just, you know, a nice way if we do this to just really build that confidence for people that have never booked with that outfitter or ever booked any outfitter period, you know, to know, okay, I know, you know, the team has gone out there and hunted with those guys, everything's legit. And, uh, you know, 
I'll, I'll trust in booking with these guys. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. No, I I hear you, man. It sounds like the other thing that I noticed, Chad, like more on the positive side of this, is there's a lot of hunts, in my opinion, that are that are way undervalued. That that are a ton yeah. of fun. You know what I mean? Like everybody thinks about elk hunting, everybody thinks yeah. about mule deer hunting, everybody thinks about mountain goat hunting, all of these. And and they are, they're a blast. But there's hunts, man. Like you mentioned Audad. I've been on Audad hunts. They're fun. Were freaking awesome. And they yeah. the terrain was, you know, the terrain was just as rough. And you know, in terms yeah. of your you know, your skill set of you know, shooting in an angled environment, long day, all of that. Like it's this, it's it's basically like if if you're in the right spot, it's basically like going on a bighorn sheep hunt. Yeah. But it's it's one tenth the cost. <laughs> yeah, you know what I, I mean? know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've I've done one odd ad hunt, and it's uh, you know, I don't. I keep saying every. I don't know why I don't go back and do that. It was so much fun. But uh, yeah, I man, it's. I agree. There's so many. You know what else was really fun was uh, an oryx. I did New Mexico oryx. Oh sure. Uh, you know, and lots of animals, and it's a big animal. You know, it's, it's fun. They have unbelievable eyesight, basically like a big antelope, you know, yeah, and, sure. uh, another one that's not very expensive. You can even do like a broken horn, you know, it's, it's maybe a couple grand and just so much fun. So much fun. Yeah. And yeah. The, it's absolutely amazing. Like Oryx oh, is probably one of my top, top four, top five, uh, wild game meets. So yeah, I mean, I agree. There's a lot of different hunts out there, uh, that are relatively cheap that, you know, can definitely be a good one for beginner hunters or anybody, honestly. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I uh, totally hear you, man. Um, and I think, I think it's just good for people to know that those are out there. Not, don't feel like you have to go on certain types of hunts to be, to be, yeah. you know, experiencing what hunting's about. There's a lot of, yeah. a lot of other options, man. Uh, one question I was going to ask you, man, when are you going to get a spear fishing trip on that list? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be completely honest with you. I'm terrified of getting in the ocean. So <laughs> probably not anytime soon. <laughs> but All right. Big things with the sharp teeth that like to eat you. Like I don't, I don't play with those things. You're not. Yeah. You're not about <laughs> that. I've done I'm, it a few times. I've dove for like abalone here in the North coast, but sure. man, there are way too many people that get eaten by great whites here. So I'm, I'm like, I'm probably going to, you know, pass on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I hear you, man. What's uh, what's on your personal, like, bucket list of hunting, Chad? Do you have any any specific hunts you want to do at some point in your life? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, obviously, sheep stuff's the, the pinnacle for me. I just did my first successful doll sheep hunt this year. I got a nice ram out in Alaska. We went uh, two years ago, 10 days, and just never saw a legal ram. So uh, it was cool to get redemption I actually um uh, am putting together uh, my buddy's putting together the whole youtube video of the the, the two trips combined oh, okay and we're cool. gonna be posting on my youtube here soon so people if they want to check it out but man that was a phenomenal hunt um I, I i drew that i got lucky and drew uh the desert uh sheep tag there at the utah show oh yeah i remember seeing that a couple years yeah. ago so man I, I i'd like to do a rocky mountain uh bighorn sheep hunt somewhere but you know yeah well, well you're so, you're dude you're you're halfway there to that I, grand slam chat so you basically have to do it now you know that's how it works i know i just i'm gonna be honest like i, I just can't i can't see myself paying for the stone sheet man that's so much money <laughs> you can't draw those so we'll see if i, I start figure, you know, my over the next 10 years the issue is that the price just keeps going up so i'm never going to catch it but yeah well you never see. know man it you you know, and I think this is it. Hunting's interesting to me, man, because uh, I was actually just a couple weeks ago. I did a podcast with Alan Bolin. Do you do you know yeah. Alan? Yeah. And uh, we were talking about it a lot, and you know, it it's uh, it's interesting because the price of hunt it do, it does change around, you know, or it does it does adjust. You know, desert sheep hunts are for sure going down fast because of the mm-hmm. availability of the hunt. So, yeah. so maybe something will change, man. But uh, yeah. but in the <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, but in the end, I, I, I hear, I hear what you're saying, but the sheep thing's interesting to me, Chad, like I've guided a lot of sheep hunts. Um, I, uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm, I'm at on Like, do I want to pursue that and, and do the grand slam? To me, it's not like, you know, in the end, if you're motivated by it, like you can figure out how to, 
how to get the money and and go yeah. go do it. It's I guess the question is is like could you take that money and time and do a bunch of other hunts that you want to do? Yeah, exactly. You know? And in all honesty, I mean, if if the slam was put in front of me and say I drew these tags and it, you know. I would do it, but it's honestly, it's not like a huge motiv motivating factor for me. Like I honestly would rather just go on another doll sheep hunt. Cause I had yeah. so much damn fun doing that. And I'm just as happy connecting on another doll over a stone, you know, but I don't know. We'll see. I say that, but yeah, yeah. Do that. Stone, I'm that have stone... to another big fight next year. If I'm going to try to pull something like that off. <laughs> yeah. I gotcha. Dude, that stone sheep uh, country is, is beautiful. Is absolutely yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Northern BC, but, um, but no, I, I hear you, man. And I think that, that sometimes that sheep deal is about like where it takes you. Right. Um, but it sounds like, it sounds like you have that bug, which is, uh, know, which it was I, fun. Yeah, yeah. It was so much fun. That, that doll sheep hunt was, I mean, you know, Alaska is just so freaking beautiful. Oh yeah, sure. But what, but what is it, Chad, for you on the sheep? Because the sheep thing it, th th there's two people there's two kind of reactions there's like people who i think kind of understand it and they're like oh like i can understand like going after you know that you know that they are very majestic they live in really cool country there's the different subspecies so there's they live in a little bit different country each so it's kind of a cool concept mm -hmm. and then there's mm -hmm. other people who are like you're an idiot for spending that much money cheap hunting, <laughs> right and there's like that's you're either uh -huh. in like one of those categories yeah. so uh yeah, I know it's a hard question, man, but what is it about sheep that, that kind of gives you that bug, I guess? Man, for me, it was a couple things. A, just the whole backcountry in Alaska thing is, you know, unlike anything else. I mean, that's, like, put it this way. We did that 10-day hunt, and, I mean, we ended up, it was all hike in, hike out. We weren't drop off or anything. So, we, I think we did, over, you know, over 100 miles of hiking back in there. It was me and a, a small group of buddies um and i mean we just went through so many ups and downs on that hunt of being so close to finding illegal and putting a stock on and sitting there for two days because we could not decide if it was legal or not um you know and then finally having to walk away because we just weren't 100 percent sure yeah, yeah sure you know and having that happen multiple times and then just basically coming out empty-handed you know and after that being living out of a tent and you know just kind of almost developing a new lifestyle within that 10 days when you step away from that then you're back in a vehicle and you're driving around and you're back in the city and there's you're stuck in traffic and your phone's ringing non-stop and i i had a little bit of depression for about a week after that trip man i just yeah i felt homesick even though i was home with my family i felt homesick for being out back in the backcountry and it's like i don't i don't know if you could ever really understand that unless you've been out there and done that because i've never felt that way before that hunt you know yeah and yeah being able to come back and have redemption on that hunt this year and then actually finding a ram and being successful but still living in that little world again is just unlike anything else and it's it's hard to explain unless you've actually done it but for me that's that's the sheep hunt and that's why i said i'd probably be okay just doing another one of those and hopefully connecting on another doll because yeah the sheep at the end of the you know that's basically the the gold at the, the end of the rainbow type thing but the journey along the way is what really stuck in my head you know and and having to push through so much adversity you know the weather and now we're fogged in and you know you're you're so up because the clock the fog clears for an hour and you start hiking up to a peak and then it fogs in again and you're just like ah so it's like so much emotional change throughout the whole thing and then yeah. being successful there at the end and being just complete high um i mean for me that's what it's all about that that mix of all that stuff yeah dude i think you you described it like a poet man i love it um <laughs> because well it, you nailed it with the thought of like uh, one thing to consider is that i mean i know you know sheep guides in the yukon or the northwest territories that uh they sold their life to it man they sold mm -hmm. their they their soul and their life and you know their you know, all the options around, you know, having a family or a career or all that, they gave that all up because of like, whatever you want to call it, man, like an addiction to chasing yeah. sheep. I mean, there's, you know, uh, for better or worse, mo a lot of those guys, nobody, nobody knows about because they're always up there, you know, and, yeah. and they don't have Instagram accounts and stuff like that. But there's a lot of them that, 
that uh yeah that obsession just like kept him there man um yeah. and i think you yeah, nailed it probably, that feeling probably from that feeling where yeah oh yeah, yeah like yeah. i said i was like homesick for it i wanted to get back out there i wanted to get out of the city and i was you know tired of seeing all the traffic and the lights and people bugging me and talk, you know yeah. having to talk to people and i just want to get back out there and, and be in the back country and living on my own terms and in my backpack and rationing food daily and trying to figure out water situations and you know what I mean? It's, it's a, it's a crazy thing, but I'm, I'm guessing that's probably why those, those guys have. Oh yeah. 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 Regular well, life. I mean, think about it too. I'm sure for a guy like you, Chad, like you got a thousand things going on. And when you're up there, uh, I mean, in reaches might ruin it a little bit, but in general, you can't, you got one thing to focus on, which yeah. is, which is cool. You know what I mean? It's, uh, the way I, uh, it's, it's funny how you describe it as like a depression or dread or something like that. Cause I, I know what you're getting at. Cause I remember coming out of the mountain sometimes after like a long, like, you know, 10 days of guiding or something like that. And like when I packed up, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm ready to go home. And then like, literally like, as I rode the horses down, like the last switchback, I would sense this, like dr this dread. Of like, oh, dude, I get it. Like now, all of a sudden, my life's back to dealing with back like all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, dude, I think you, I think you encompassed it uh, perfectly, man. And uh, Chad, I really appreciate you coming on, man. I know you're a crazy uh -huh. busy guy, um, and so I, I want to be uh, polite with your time, man. But uh, uh, tell the listeners where they can, where they can follow you, and and all that real quick. Yeah, I mean, Instagram's the main, my main platform that I probably put more time into anything. It's uh, just at Chad Mendez is my handle. Um, I do have a Twitter and Instagram as well, or sorry, Twitter and um, uh, Facebook as well. And then YouTube, you know, I, I haven't been really keeping up on a lot of stuff recently, but um, there's a ton of stuff over the last few years of me basically self-logging a lot of my hunts. I do a lot of the editing myself and posting kind of my adventures throughout the years on there. Um, so if anyone wants to check out any of those, if you're uh, curious, you can go see those, but we will have that sheep hunt up here shortly. So cool. that is, that's going to be a pretty high production type. My buddy drew with Nomad Collective went out there. He went on the first 10 day and then came back for this one. So um, we got some really cool footage from both. So. Sweet, man. Cool. Well, everybody should go check it out. Thanks, Chad. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care. I really enjoyed that conversation with Chad, and I really appreciate the fact he took the time to be on the podcast. He's got a ton going on, so I encourage all of the listeners out there to get on social media and follow him. If you want to keep in touch with me, get on my YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Cliff Gray. It'll pop up. You can subscribe to the channel. I've been trying to keep new videos coming out weekly. You can also sign up for my newsletter at PursuitWithCliff.com or follow me on my Instagram at CliffGRY. That's C-L-I-F-F-G-R-Y. Thanks for listening.